I'm Karen Dwyer and this is Win the Day with James Whitaker. You're listening to Win the Day with James Whitaker. What we do in life echoes in eternity. Broadcasting from Los Angeles, California. Here's your host, James Whitaker. Let's go. Hey winners, welcome back to Win the Day. If this is your first time here, we sit down with some of the world's true change makers to give you all the tips, tools, and strategies to win the day every day. The quote for this episode comes from Think and Grow Rich author Napoleon Hill and says, Every adversity, every failure, every heartbreak carries with it the seed of an equal or greater benefit. One of my all-time favorite quotes. And our guest today has come through her adversity with an enormous amount of inspiration and courage. Karen Dwyer is a TEDx speaker, award-winning health coach, and founder of MS2 Success. After a career leading multi-million dollar businesses in finance, media, and luxury retail, Karen received a debilitating MS diagnosis at the age of 31 that caused her to rethink every aspect of her life. Through a process that we'll get into today, Karen now lives symptom-free, creating a complete shift in her mental, physical, and emotional well-being, and is on a mission to help others do the same. Through her keynote presentations, Talk Healing to Me podcast, and MS to Success programs, as well as the latest scientific research on neuroplasticity, nutrition, and movement, she's helping people all over the world to take charge of their own health and happiness. Karen is a leader in neurodiversity, sits on a number of international health advisory boards, and is a member of the International Coaches Federation. She has been awarded Best Health and Wellbeing Coach in the Republic of Ireland and Best Nonprofit COVID Response, and been named one of the top female business leaders to watch. In this episode, we're going to talk with Karen about her journey from diagnosis to being completely symptom free, how she eases fear and captures intent for those who are receiving a disease diagnosis, what she's doing to build mass resilience at a time when the world needs it most, and how you can raise your hand for help when you're at your most vulnerable. Before we begin, remember that the right bit of inspiration can completely change the trajectory of someone's life. So if there's a friend or loved one out there who needs to hear this episode or could use some help to win the day, share it with them right now. All right, let's win the day with my good friend, Karen Dwyer. Karen, Thank you for flying in from Ireland. It is so great to see you. How does it feel to finally be on the Win the Day podcast? Listen, it's surreal. James, I said to you before, I had this on my vision board and, you know, waking up this morning in LA, being picked up, this, like, it's just insane. <laughs> it's so great to be here. Thank you for the invite. Well, you've, you've got such an amazing energy. You and I have known each other for a long time now. You've got such a great, beautiful, genuine heart and you've been able to help so many people around the world. So I'm really excited for the things that we're going to talk about today. Uh, to kick things off, I would love to know that when you were younger, like where did you think that you would be right now in your life and career and how far away are you from that? Oh, great question. So I wanted to be a singer when I was younger. Uh, so a singer or a dancer or something to do with musical theatre. Um, but ideally a singer, like love, love, love it. How close am I to that now? Oh, I couldn't be further away other than <laughs> singing around the house and my kids telling me to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> what, what about that quote from, from earlier, the Napoleon Hill quote, every adversity, every failure, every heartbreak carries with it the seed of an equal or greater benefit. What, what does that quote mean to you? Uh, it, it's such a beautiful quote. And, and I have a Facebook post at the moment that talks about, you know, MS doesn't have to be a life sentence. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's interesting the replies that I got because everything that I look back on now I can see the joy, I can see the light, I can see the lesson and I can see the reciprocity in it. And it's not to say I want to welcome in hardship into my life. It's not that. We all want to live a life. But I think, you know, if we expect a smooth road, we feel every bump along the way. And I suppose being able to look back and instead of being resentful or angry or upset, I think when you can take that and either forgive yourself or somebody else, if there's somebody else involved, you grow in exponential ways. I mean, it's it's a gift to yourself and to everyone else as well. A relevant thing that's going on at the moment, a couple of years ago, I had a really bad financial year and there was stuff going on and I had to move home and there was a lot of outlays. And, and you know, there was a few sleepless nights. Mm -hmm. Anyway, my daughter's starting college shortly and I had to submit figures for her to, you know, to get this kind of grant thing for her going to college. And it was based on that year, those mm. finances. And I, I actually said to my daughter, now I know why that was so hard. Mm. I, I can see that. And I think the secret to living a, a like a superb life 
is when you're in the midst of something really shit and you can say, I know I'm just in it and I know it's going to work out. Mm. And I know there's going to be some lesson in this. I think that's the key. Mm. I really, really think because it allows your body then to ease and relax and you're not pushing against something. So Yeah, mic drop. That's that's huge. That's a really important point and really excited to get into your, your personal story shortly. MS, we're of course talking about multiple sclerosis for those who don't know. Do you want to give like a little bit of an overview of just what that is and, and how many people it affects and, and how it affects them? Sure. Yeah. So... Multiple sclerosis, it's a neurological degenerative disease and it affects about 2.6 million people around the world. There's a ratio of three to one women and there's three different types. There's uh, relapse remitting, which was the one I was diagnosed with. There's secondary progressive and primary progressive. And and it's, it's interesting because no two MS diagnoses are the same. And so somebody might suffer with mobility issues. For somebody else, it might be optic neuritis or debilitating fatigue or brain fog. For me, um, it was numbness. I couldn't see in one eye, extreme pain, like so much stuff going on. But I suppose the disease itself, because there's no definitive path of, you know, if you get another disease like cancer or something else like that, it's like, here's the treatment. This is what's going to happen. They can see a definitive path. With MS, it's like, well, we don't know. It might not get worse. It might get really worse. And so there's there's a huge amount of anxiety when somebody gets diagnosed because not only do they have the diagnosis, but there's like a complete being out of control because they don't know what's around the corner for them at all. Mm. Yeah. And patients want that certainty, don't they? At least in some regard. Mm. Yeah. I think the only thing about certainty is that we're certain that there is no certainty. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Expect <laughs> you know? the unexpected. Yeah. yeah. Take us into the moment that you received your MS diag- diagnosis, what your life was like at the time and what mindset that then contributed to. Mm. So it was not long after I had my second daughter, Sadie, who's now almost 11, and I was showering and I was drying my hair and I realized I couldn't feel the heat on my head. So I started touching both sides of my body and realized the entire right side was numb. Now, a few days before that, I did have numbness in my two fingers and up my forearm and I did go to the hospital and ask because I thought, hmm. I didn't, I knew I didn't feel right, but I couldn't put my finger on what it was. Mm. I was sent home and said, you know, you've probably slept on it funny. And because the doctor was really good looking, I was like, okay, that's fine. (laughs) And I went home. That was okay. Um, But getting out of the shower this time and I knew when I couldn't feel the right hand side of my body, I was wondering then, did I have a stroke? Am I having a stroke? Is it a heart attack? Like what's going on? So I packed a bag silently. I didn't even tell my partner at the time and got myself uh, to the emergency room and this time they took me straight away down for an MRI and I remember they took me down in a wheelchair and I remember thinking oh there's something not right here so I was extremely claustrophobic so they had to give me a Xanax and I was in the machine for like about an hour because they were doing it on the spine and on the brain and all the rest Um, and I remember these hot tears in my eyes when I was in the MRI machine thinking just let it be okay like whatever it is just come on, you're going to be okay. But also like it's, it's that, you know, not being able to move and you can feel your own emotion coming out. It Like it was, it was a, it was a tough moment to be present with. Mm-hmm. Anyway, they took me back out, they brought me back up and they wheeled me into a smaller room. And that's when I was like, oh, okay, something really serious here. And I remember a really well-dressed doctor coming in in a three-piece suit and saying, Mr. Dwyer, the number of lesions on your brain would be normal for an 80-year-old. He said the severe demyelination there. And of course I had been Googling and MS and demyelination come up and I said, is it multiple sclerosis? And he kind of looked at me pissed off saying, well, how do you know? And I held up my phone. He was like, well, actually, the likelihood is that it is. We're going to keep you in and do a spinal tap or a lumbar puncture. But it's most likely like it's 99% MS. So they kept me in. And you know what? I I had three emotions that day. I had fear, of course, like, am am I going to end up in the wheelchair that they've wheeled me back up in? Mm. Because that's all that I knew. I was very ignorant to you know, what MS was. That was my only vision. The second one I had was relief because now I had a, I had a name to put on how strange I was feeling because I couldn't quite verbalize what it was. I just wasn't feeling right. And then the third one, which I can probably describe as hope. And I describe it as like having a little light in my tummy that was always there, but this time it like really lit up. And I was like, Karen, you know what? This isn't your first rodeo. You've been through a lot of shit before. Mm you're going to be fine and you're going to get through this. And something said to me, and I, I get a little bit embarrassed when I say this, 
but I'm going to say it anyway, but something inside me said, you're going to be a spokesperson for people with MS and you're going to reverse it in that moment. So yeah, I like, and that I didn't feel like that for the next few years all the time, but, but, you know, I have managed to get to a point where I, I have become a spokesperson for it. And, and I've had other people transform their illness out of, out of me showing them what I've did and bringing in extra research as well. Was there a particularly dark day after the diagnosis as you became accustomed to, to that, that sort of stands out or that you remember? Yeah, I think the day was when I collapsed driving on the motorway and I had to be taken into hospital. So I was on lots of different medications and I kept having reactions to them. And they brought me in this time and said that I was, I have an infection on my brain. My liver count is seven times higher than it should have been. And I had to come off all medication. And it was like, okay, now I'm up shit creek with no paddle. Mm. Now it's time to actually do it. Because if I'm really honest, I think there was something in the back of my mind going, shit, there's medication there. And I remember reading an article, oh, they found a cure for MS and they'll have it out in 10 years. So I, I think I mentally sat back and went, mm. it's fine. I'll just do what the doctors tell me and I'll, you know, I'll wait for that. I'm good. But now it was like, oh you've actually got to take a bit of accountability for yourself. And it was exciting in one way, but it was scary in another. But um, I think that was the day that really stands out that it was like I, for the first year after that, I didn't take anything on. Mm. And that was hard. So if it was a dark day, could I turn that into a dark year mm. <laughs> instead? And then it wasn't until a, a big life event happened and I thought, okay, now's the time. Mm. Uh, we've mentioned Napoleon Hill a couple of times today. Um, I have mentioned on this show before that a big turning point for me was in my early 20s when I realized that just as we can think and grow rich, we can think and grow poor. And in fact, I think if we don't have the intent of being proactive about thinking and growing rich, that by default, we're already thinking and growing poor. Um, what do you, how did you feel about that time in terms of willing these different things? You know, like we, these thoughts that we create become our reality, good or bad? Yeah, brilliant question. So I didn't realize until somebody asked me, what are you grateful for? I didn't realize how low I had sank until I was asked that question. And my reaction was that I got really angry. I was like, how dare you ask me what I'm grateful for when I'm now a single mom with two kids. I'm on an invalidity pension. I have no job. I have no car. I'm living on my mom's and I have no hope. What are you grateful for? You can, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and it was in that moment that I thought, oh shit, like, you know, you used to be really happy mm. and like you had a great job. You really loved life. Like you celebrated everything. You were out all the time having fun with your friends. And now somebody's asking you grateful for and you're having a visceral reaction. Mm. And it was that moment that I decided, and I actually I made a commitment by writing in my journal that I made a commitment to make myself happy. Mm. And that was it. And it was that, you mentioned it, like creating that intent. And I remember listening to one of your other episodes where you said, if you're not winning the day, actually, it was when I interviewed you, and so <laughs> loads of people have come back and and uh, pointed this out. If you if you're not making a choice to win the day, you're automatically losing. Yeah. And that like that's exactly it. Mm. So it was from that moment onward that I realised that I could influence my health, mm. my happiness, and everything else that happened in my life. And it was like somebody just gave me the key to unlock my own prison. Mm. You know, having the extra challenge. You and I were talking offline about some of the challenges that come from parenting as much as we love our kids. You've got two beautiful daughters. W was being a parent a blessing during that time or was it an extra burden that just added an enormous amount of challenge to that that um time? Yeah, blessing, like without a shadow of a doubt. And look, there was days and it was like, oh my God, like dragging my ass out yeah. of bed. Because you know, I fatigue, like chronic fatigue was one of the things. I remember I had to go sleep in the car at the halftime during my eldest daughter's sports games, you know, because I literally couldn't stand. So having the kids there that I had to get up and, you know, make lunches and dinners and all the rest. And honestly, during that time, I didn't want to, mm. but it was probably the only thing that saved me because if I didn't have them, I probably would have stayed in bed. Did you know? they, uh, yeah, feeling sorry for yourself and... Mm. Did they, um, did they understand what was going on? Sadie didn't, my youngest didn't, but Alan did. And she's very, very intuitive, like really smart girl. And actually she wants to be a nurse now. She's just finished school. She just has that caring nature about it. But I also, like, I've no doubt that it's had an effect on her. Yeah. You know, I, I think she's grown up a lot quicker than 
Sadie has, mm. you know, and firstborn and first child and stuff as well. I think they tend to do that anyway. Mm. But um, yeah, there's definitely a part of me that like gets upset when I think like, oh God, like I like spend so many different weeks in hospital, you know, with different complications and relapses and all the rest. And I think God, her poor little head being mm. at home and her mum's in hospital, like that can't have been easy. Yeah, some people are forced to grow up quick. Mm. Yeah, it means they have a tough head on their shoulders as a result. Eh? Totally. And do you know what? Yeah. Everyone says that meets her like she's the most well-rounded kid mm. and she's very, you know, giving and personable and all the rest. So I, I've no doubt that it has, you know, brought along forward, but also, you know, it's, it's of course, you wouldn't, you don't wish it on them either. Yeah. You had, um, you know, amazing progress as a result of all, a lot of the heartache that you've been able to, to share with us so candidly today, which I think is very important is being upfront about those vulnerabilities. So thank you very much. Uh, was there a line that you felt like you crossed where you were like, wow, this this is in my rear view mirror? Or what was that moment when you realised that the steps that you had taken had actually given you a lot of progress over the diagnosis that you had initially received? Yeah, great question again. Um, I think going back into my neurologist's office two years after, uh, was it three years? Two or three years after being told I had to come off all the medication. And like I said, the first year after that was dark mm. you know I, I really struggled and then after that my ex walked out on Christmas day which was like oh my god you're kidding that was the one, another turning point where I thought you know what I've got to do this for me I've got to stop waiting for somebody else to support me go and do it for yourself but a year after that I'm back in my neurologist's office and um, I'd had a couple of MRIs I, I had them every six months at that time and I walk back into my ne neurologist's office and each time there's always a pain in my stomach before I go in because you don't know if they're going to tell you that you've got more lesions on your brain or your spine. You don't know if they're going to tell you, OK, you've got to go on a different medication now. And I had so many severe reactions to them. And I must point out, medications work great for people. And a lot of people, they just didn't work with my body and, and my reactions to them. But sitting down at my neurologist and him saying, what have you been doing? And I thought, oh, I was trying to read his body language and his breathing and how he was looking at me. And he said, um, all your lesions have shrunk. They've all shrunk. What have you been doing because you're not on medication? So I started listing out everything and he's like, OK, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. And I was like, you're joking, because, James, it was in a way some of the simplest things, mm -hmm. you know, forgiveness of myself was one of the biggest things, like actually surrendering to where I was at, not where I thought I should be, not where I wanted to be in the past, you know, letting all of that go. And that commitment to making myself happy every single day had me start exercising, had me start moving and speaking in a different way about myself, had me eating and making different choices about who I spoke with, you know, and who I hung out with. I mean, everything came through that filter of commitment to make myself happy. But that word, that sentence from a neurologist saying, you know, it's burnt out. Your MS has, has left the building. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're doing incremental things over a long period of time, it isn't until you look back into that rearview mirror and see like such a transformation, because when you're in it every day, it doesn't feel like it because, you know, you're just doing it. So, yeah, I'd say that would be the moment. Yeah, it's so powerful. And the decision to keep putting in the reps when you don't see the big changes, isn't it? It's like the, the discipline to keep going when you don't see results. It's only in a year, two years, three years, you know, whatever activity it is that you um that you're able to look back and and you can be proud of yourself for the journey that you've been on. Totally, yeah. yeah. And look, I, I say that with clients and stuff as well. You know, if you go into a gym and you work out for one day and you look in the mirror, you know, afterwards, you're not going to see any difference. You're probably not going to see any difference after a week. You might see a little one after a month, but I think when you can get to the point where you're not like in this fight or flight response trying to force something to happen yeah. that you can allow yourself to be and develop yourself as you're going and embrace the person that you're becoming mm. and unbecoming in the process. It it becomes a beautiful process rather than a moving away from or being scared motivation that you're running away from something that's scaring you. You're moving towards that person that you want to be in the life you want to live. Yeah, something that you and Janine Shepard, uh, that you both share, which I think is so great, is not being afraid to let go of who you think you were so you can finally step into being who you who you are now and who you want to become. It's the biggest compliment being compared to Janine <laughs> Shepard, yes. <laughs> and, and what is your current reality now in terms of MS, symptoms, quality of life, that type of thing? Yeah, so it's, it's all burnt out. No more symptoms. I haven't had any symptoms since 2014. Um, Quality of life is great. I mean, the kids and I, I've got a beautiful home with my two gorgeous daughters. We we live a great life. And, you know, I, I've now turned what I did. I mean, I accidentally set up a company 
helping others transform their MS into a, cas- a catalyst for positive change mm-hmm. in their health, but also in other areas of their life too. And so I think we're present in 24 different countries now with the programme. So Huge. it's, I mean, it's great. And it's also, you know, it forces you to let go of any of those, those little underlying you're not good enough or who are you to do this? You know, they still come up, you know, mm. every now and again. But um, I think when you got a passion to cause some transformation somewhere and you can see the before and after with clients, I mean, it's it's food for the soul. Mm. I've had people, you know, reverse optic neuritis, eyesight loss. We've had people that have gone back into work or gone out and had the confidence to have a relationship again and they've had babies or, you know, I've had people start to improve their mobility and start walking again. Like, I mean, it, it it's hard not to get really emotional when you see people realise their own influence on their health. It's the most beautiful gift because yeah. it's not me that's doing the work. I'm just holding the space for them. They're doing the work and, and, and I'm just cheering them on. It's It's brilliant. Mm-hmm. I love that. I also want to mention that this November, I am coming to Brisbane, Australia, and hopefully Karen's coming with me as well. We're hosting We Are Podcast. If you're a business owner and you want to win the day using your voice, this event will be held over two days, the 10th and 11th of November, to show you how to get more listeners, how to get more clients, and how to get more credibility using your podcast. So for more information on that, go to wearepodcast.com. Karen, tell us about your podcast as well. I know we've been doing some some cool things together and um, <laughs> yeah. you're here for an amazing event that we're, that we're hosting tomorrow for part of our We Are podcast stuff. But what is the mission that you're hoping to have with your Talk Healing to Me podcast? Mm, and just to add to what you just said, and I will answer that in a second, launching the podcast has been so cathartic because I've been definitely playing small with what I'm doing because, you know, my clients come in and all of the work that I do is referral. So I've never had to put myself out there, so to speak. You know, I've never advertised or anything like that. And doing the podcast is a whole other level of vulnerability. Mm. And it's forced me in a really gorgeous way, by the way, with you and Ron's, you know, being supported there. And, you you know, you know, I've, I've had that little like, oh, God, I want to, but I'm scared. And will I or won't I? Or how will I do it? But it's been the most beautiful thing. Uh, of course, recording them and, and publishing them and all the rest is great. But it's the messages afterwards from people who, someone in Zimbabwe that messaged me the other day saying, oh my God, that resonated so much. Thank you for asking that question. Like I really felt seen. That's the joy because you never know who's listening. So if anybody's even thinking about podcast, absolutely join these two. <laughs> um, but personally and professionally, it's great. Yeah. So mine is called Talk Healing to Me, Stories for Women with MS. We do allow men listen to though. It's okay. Um <laughs> And so it's really bringing all aspects of healing um, into a conversation because the understanding that I get or the understanding that I had, I'll say rather than anybody else about healing was food and exercise. Mm. And it's so much more than that. So I have like five pillars that I I talk about with um, my clients and it's mindset first, then nutrition, then movement, then nurture, things like breathing, meditation and lots of other things and then sleep. Of course, Dr. Michael Bruce, we're having a conversation with soon. But um, it's so important that the person realizes that they can influence their health. And so when we Google things online or go to Dr. Google, sometimes you can come away feeling more scared than inspired. And that doesn't help anyone. Whereas if you can be part of a conversation from your own living room and somebody can hear Mm. real people having real transformations and it's not I don't mean just a doctor that sees patients, but it's somebody that's actually lived it and talking to people that have lived it too and come through the other side. I think that's priceless for whatever the subject may be. Mine just happens to be multiple sclerosis. It's exactly. It's so, you know, just like I mentioned there with the We Are podcast event, it's getting people together with common values who are not afraid to put themselves out there, who have a shared purpose or a shared mission, like what you're doing there to get people who are on a similar journey. And I know you've said in in previous interviews, it can be very daunting, the idea of um, being around other people who are going through this. If you can look at someone who might be a lot worse off than you, which I imagine will be the toughest thing with chronic, one of the toughest things with with chronic illness, where you're like, wow, is that going to be my future reality? And there can be a lot of disjointing things there, but that spirit of community and bringing leaders together, like the work that you're doing to empowering that community, it gives people not only the sense of hope, but the proven tools, the framework that you just shared to be able to have that confidence to take the first step and give them the inspiration to be consistent with it. Yeah, it's beautiful. And I love being able to highlight and showcase the success stories, you know, and I see it over and over again, like there's success traits within 
all of my clients like being open and being committed and actually having the belief that they can do it. So if they see somebody that's even just one step ahead of them, mm. they can have that belief then too, or they can borrow from them so that it helps them move forward and mm. get unstuck. So it's, it's a really lovely thing to be a part of with people around the world. With the people that you've worked with now in, in you know, you've mentioned more than 20 countries around the world. What is the mental battle that happens with someone, with someone when they receive a diagnosis for disease or chronic illness? Mm. I think the feeling of being out of control is certainly one of them because it's like, you know, a lot of people say MS is a disease where, you know, your body is attacking itself. It's not directly true, but it it is in a way. And I think it feels like for people that they're living with an enemy every day. And a lot of times people want to say how scared they are, but they don't want to be pitied. They don't want to be um, looked down upon and they certainly don't want to be treated differently. I certainly didn't. And so there's this, you know, barrier between I want to be honest and I want to be open and I want support. But also there's the commitment to I'm not going to let this change me. So the person ends up on this hamster wheel, probably trying to overcompensate so that they continue doing the normal things that they're doing so that they don't fall behind. But then on the other side of that, they're exhausting themselves, trying to keep up. And so not allowing themselves or their body the grace or the the honor to actually heal. So it's a, it's a really kind of complicated headspace to be in. And also, you know, I see it over and over again. People will do things every day. They'll go and they'll give their absolute best to work and, you know, to their kids and to everybody else around them. And of course, that's brilliant and people have commitments. But people often find it very hard to stop and to look in the mirror because and it's a really hard and scary thing to do when you're facing a disease because what if you do try something and it doesn't work and then you may have wasted time or money or energy. So sometimes it's just easier to keep doing what you're doing and just hope for the best. Mm. And I I don't believe that that's the best thing to do, because I think when you do take action, you know, action cures fear. I think when you do know that you're putting everything that you can into yourself and you're taking those small incremental, I don't think it's like go crazy doing crazy diets or exercise regimes. I actually go, I'm completely against that. Mm. When you do believe and trust in yourself, Everything changes. Mm. Everything changes. For me, I, the health challenges that I have had, um, obviously you you pay doctors and, and specialists to give you their opinion and their advice, which is exceptionally important, but they're not the ones who have to live with this. You're the one who has to go home. So I've found that the the biggest thing to me is, the, is how I feel about myself in terms of these different things. Like I have a, a tumor in my spine that I go and get scans for every six months. I go and get a full brain, full spinal scan. And, you know, there are people going through uh, very different things apart from that. And when I first had found out about that, it was some tough battles for me in terms of like, oh, wow, what is this restricting my life from here? But it was me being able to be present when I'm in the appointments with a specialist. And then I don't even think about it when I'm not even in those, in those situations, even though the reality is that if I'm not getting the regular scans, I might eventually lose feeling in the right side of my body or in the right side of my foot. And um, that is is can be part of the reality with this tumor in my spine. How do you balance the um, respect for an unbelievably qualified doctor and specialist who you have consulted to versus the power of the mind that you need to be able to live with this stuff on a, on a daily basis? Yeah, great. Um, do you know what? It, it's a hard one. Let me reverse that. It can be a hard one if you choose it to be. And I think we can put all of our autonomy over there with the doctor and they're brilliant and they've studied for so many years. And you're right in saying, you know, you're left with your own thoughts and your daily life that, you know, that's not taken into account when you see a specialist every six months or, or a year. So I think it's important to be able to take on what they say and ask as many questions as you possibly can. You know, how will this affect my daily life? What should I avoid? What should I, you know, continue doing or or maybe look into a little bit more. But I think having your own autonomy and and drive and commitment to, you know, what is the lifestyle that you want? You know, how is it that you want to live and not waiting for appointment to appointment to be told either good news or bad news? Because, you know, in between then, like you're not living and we do sometimes hand over. I, like I still do it. So if I go to the doctor, I'm like, OK, please tell me rather than actually going, OK, well, what can I do for myself? And a lot of times you have to wait for a doctor. You know, they're there for a reason and they do great work. But I think having some kind of practice, mm. daily practice for sure. I mean, the the basics of things are, are you know, having a really solid 
morning and evening routine, you know, making sure that your lifestyle works for you, you know, what you eat, what you do, but also planning and taking responsibility around that. That's the biggest thing that we can do. Biggest thing. I've seen people make the tiniest changes and two months later, completely different. Life. Mm. So I, I think balancing out your own influence and power and and, and uh, um, putting that together with the uh, with your doctor's advice is so important. Yeah, that's really well said. When I was in Boston, I had this really damaging um, shoulder injury and I went and saw a doctor and he said he gave me this whole bunch of, you know, these painkillers, which made me horrifically depressed. It was a really sort of depressive time in my life as a result of this because he had also said that I wouldn't be able to do the fitness things that I love doing ever again. And I just wish I had have known about stories like yours and Janine Shepherd's and so many other stories out there of, of resilience. I mean, it's, it's huge. I mean, at the end of the day, you're the one who has the power to overcome so many different things and what people have been able to achieve through history, that the lessons of resilience and strength out there and freedom, even just looking up adaptive athletes on Instagram or TikTok will give you this mosaic of so many different inspirational people. It's great just to, to see that, the hope and the opportunity, rather than reducing yourself to what you um, might be capable of achieving based on someone else's belief. Totally true. And you know what? Thank you for saying that because I've had clients that come to me and they'll say, oh, my neurologist said this to me and they have been like a deer in headlights since because they'll say, oh, you'll never be able to do that again. And it's like, who in the hell said that to you? And like, I've asked for neurologist phone numbers from my clients. I'm like, give me that phone number. They have no right to say that to you. So I like I've I've a healthy frustration with, you know, the medical world and I love them dearly and they, you know, they've done great things for me. But there's a lot of time that like bedside manner and some words like they could all do with a little bit and not everyone, <laughs> but could do with, you know, some neurolinguistic programming, yeah. you know, and, and what they're saying and what people are left with can be like really, really damaging or, or really, really healthy. And when somebody is in a very vulnerable state, you're like Velcro, you're really sticky to whatever your doctor says. And one sentence could literally change the trajectory. You say in the beginning of your of your podcast, mm -hmm. it can change the trajectory of someone's life. Mm -hmm. And a doctor holds immense power. So I'm, I'm always very, very conscious of, you know, somebody making a great relationship with a neurologist and actually being able to say, is that your personal opinion or is that a medical opinion? Mm. You know, and to be able to kind of go, hang on, actually, should you be saying that to me? And actually, does that have merit? Mm. Balancing practical steps of hope versus managing expectations, you know, and of course they're in, in difficult situations as well. But I, I think that's, um, I think that's great what you said there. I'm going to get bashed now from the medical system. Yeah, I'm no, well, <laughs> but I mean, you, you, the things that we're talking about here, you, you're talking about the lessons from from your own journey. Like Janine Shepherd, she was told she'd never be able to walk again. I mean, she's had three kids, she skis, rides a bike, despite still being classified as a paraplegic. I mean, there are very real cases of this, so mm -hmm. uh, I think it's important to let people know that. What are the greatest realizations or discoveries? that you've had, whether it's about the power of the mind or the body um, from your work in neuroplasticity or working with people all around the world or from your own journey, what, what really stands out? Yeah, I, I would say the biggest realisation is that I can directly influence myself and my health. Like, because, you know, I think when you're younger and you grow up, you kind of, you feel like you're a young person, you, you know, and you're probably told to, you know, be quiet or don't do this or do that. And you kind of put everything else into somebody else's hands. And then when you grow a bit older and you start to flex a little bit of, OK, I can actually do this for myself or if I do this, then this happens. So, you know, consequence and impact, but actually like really taking charge and ownership of yourself and being responsible for yourself is actually quite an exciting thing. You know, it can be like, oh, my God, I've got to be responsible or oh, my God, I can actually be responsible for my own joy, my happiness and great health. And I think taking that seriously with joy and with some fun, biggest realisation. Mm. Yeah, that it doesn't have to be all hard work and no joy in order to have good health. And I don't know if it's a Catholic thing mm. that like you must be, you know, God fearing or <laughs> you must feel, you know, worried about something for it to turn out well and actually realising that doesn't have to be that way. Yeah, yeah big realization. That extreme ownership, such a such a big one. It's like the more uh, the more you are accountable for your own situation, then the more empowered you are to be able to fix it. I see people complaining about not even health, complaining about everything about what it is that they don't have and how there is nothing they can do to change their own current circumstances because of all these external forces. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, there is which is a common theme of every single person who comes on the show. There is always something that you can do to move forward, even ever so slightly to think bigger, surround yourself with better people or improve the circumstances that you're in. Yeah, even just your words. Mm. 
just your words. Like one of the rules in my programs is no gossiping mm. and no talking badly about yourself. Like no taking yourself down, even if it's a like, and I do it a little bit, you know, some self-deprecating stuff like, but like it's no gossiping. And if you're involved in that conversation, it's either excuse yourself or be like, hey, I don't do that anymore because it just doesn't work for me or my health or my well-being. Mm. You know, and really being responsible around that huge, huge changes in that too. Now your MS to Success programs, tell us about who that's for and what type of work you're doing. Sure. Uh, so I specialize with women with MS. Um, and I mean, like I was saying earlier on, 24 different countries now. And what most people come to me for is the diet and exercise. Tell me what to eat. Tell me what to do. And it's the last things that we do. So the first thing I work on is around mindset and calming hidden inflammation. So most people think that inflammation comes from food. Mm. And yes, it does. But also stress is a major, major factor in that. So a lot of people, and I see it in a lot of health and well-being programs, it's like, okay, eat this, move like this and do, you know, go really hard. And I, I turn that on its head. It's like, do not be doing crazy exercises. Do not go straight into a really strict diet. We've got to make sure that your foundation of health is built. It's, you know, like a house. If you build it on something with lots of cracks, you're going to end up having to go back and fix it. So we assess people's stress. We look at their daily life. We look at what's working, what's not. Um... And, you know, we observe the automatic negative thoughts mm. and we look at people's beliefs and values because it's not one size fits all. It's got to be personalized. So we create a brain health blueprint for every single person. So it's personalized to your health, James, if you came and you worked with me or it's personalized to Jacinta's health in Australia, you know. Um, and so we build that in very well designed steps that we get that first. Then we move into a little bit of nutrition and tracking. But we've got to look at what people are doing now in order to be able to move forward. We've got to have mm -hmm. that solid base. And then we look at everything from breathing, getting your autonomic nervous system aligned before we put anything else there. If people start changing their movement patterns and we don't do exercise, it's it's more movement, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, related. We've got movement therapist and neurophysio. So it's all very, very aligned to getting the best out of your system without overexerting yourself. Um, and then we look at sleep secrets for optimal health, uh, meditation, EFT. I mean, we've got so many experts around the world. We actually had a music therapy workshop the other day. So, you know, even creating playlists for when you're feeling tired or, you know, aligning your mood, taking you from tired all the way up to energetic. So we, 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 I'd like to say that we think of every part of your life. I'm sure that we can always learn and add in some more, but it's a very, very special journey um, that we co-create with people along the way. A question I wanted to ask you, I feel like you covered it so well there. I, a thing that I love about your work is that individualized approach. So many people out there, they're very quick to give someone, here is the solution before they've even taken the time to understand the problem. So that's the big issue I have with all of these so-called experts is like, here's the one size fits all solution for everyone. How about asking more questions to get clear on what exactly what the problem is and what the person's trying to achieve? And it sounds like you do exactly that with your programs. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, look, I, I, I created this because that's what I would have wanted. Mm -hmm. You know, I had Dr. Google and I tried different things. And honestly, James, I failed for every success that I've had. I failed at least 20 times. Mm -hmm. I've, you know, cried or felt desperate or, you know, didn't know what to do. And I honestly wanted to give up. So this is why I created that because I felt like I was doing different things with different people in all different parts of the world. And honestly, I was spending a lot of money. I was feeling guilty about that because what if it didn't work or what if I wasn't able to keep up with it? Mm. And then you end up feeling much shitter than when you started, you know, when you have that excited feeling. So I've brought all of the health experts that I believe make a difference yeah. to MS Health into one place and then people get to create it themselves. But um, the program is designed for you to fail mm -hmm. at points in it so that you're not doing it by yourself. So I'm like the, the people that are the most successful lean in, whether it's good or bad. And the one thing that I say to everyone is whatever way you show up works, just show up. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't care if you come on, you know, to one of the calls and you're crying. Great. You're here. Mm -hmm. Let's let's work with that, mm -hmm. you know, but just showing up is half the battle. Yeah, it's so powerful. It's so good. A good life lesson, too. For someone who has just received a diagnosis of chronic illness or in the midst of any type of adversity and hardship, what can they do to raise their hand for, for help so they can start to, to open up and get the support that they need? Mm. So I think when people get diagnosed first, they look at what? What can I do to help me? Or um, 
how, how can I do this? And actually, I think the secret is in asking who. Mm-hmm. Who has done it before? And I'm not saying there's loads of other people that have have done what I've done as well. Find someone who can support you and someone that you can lean into and say, you know what? I am here. There's a gap between where I want to go to. Can you either support me or help me find someone? That's the biggest, biggest thing that I wish I did that years beforehand. But I, I didn't want to. I felt too proud and I didn't want anyone to realize that I was suffering so much. And it's it's the scariest thing, but it's the biggest gift that you'll ever give. And if that person can't help you, find somebody else who can, but find the who. Find somebody else that's even just a couple of steps before you. How do you handle bad days when they happen now? Yeah, good question. How do I handle them? Handle them. Sometimes I handle them badly, <laughs> yes, if I'm honest. Sometimes I just want to sit down and eat and watch really shitty TV. <laughs> and that like, sometimes that does the job. Um, you know, I find sometimes I'm having a, a, a day where I'm overwhelmed or there's just so much going on. The best gift that I can do for myself is to do nothing yeah. and just have the restorative time. So actually it's such a gift. So not reading, not watching TV, even like actually just sitting there and staring out the window can be the biggest thing. So taking a break from whatever I'm doing. And then other days it's sitting down and eating some like, favorite food and watching some really banal TV. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's so refreshing. Like a lot of people out there who want to run harder on the, the treadmill and you just get burnt out. It's not good for anyone if yeah, that happens. Totally. Yeah. And look, there's other days where like, yes, I'll meditate and I could say all those wonderful things, but actually there's some days and I just go, fuck it. I just gotta actually I'm just gonna rest. <laughs> uh, final question before we move into the rocket round. On your best day, what's an affirmation that you would write on a flashcard to show yourself on your worst day? Yeah. Anything is possible. Mm. Love it. All right, let's move into the win the day rocket round now. Ten questions for some quick answers. You up for this one, Karen? Let's go. All right, number one, what quote inspires you the most? Oh, whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. Henry Ford? Yeah. Yeah, love it. Number two, morning coffee or evening wine? Wine. (laughs) <laughs> Number three, what's one bit of advice you would give your 18-year-old self? Oh, love yourself first. Number four, what book do you gift the most? Uh, probably The Four Agreements. That book is mentioned a lot on this show. I think that's, that's great. If people haven't seen it, go and check it out. Yeah. Tom Brady loves that one too. Number five, was there a vulnerability you once hid within that became your superpower? Yeah, I think actually letting people know that you're not okay. You know, I think that gives access to other people to show up mm. authentically. Because yeah. if you're putting on the show that everything is great and everything is perfect all the time, well, then nobody has the space to have access to themselves. So actually saying that you're not OK is, is I think, such a gift, mm. not just to myself, but to everyone else. So true. Number six, what's one thing you've learned about failure? Everyone has it. And just, I, I think... If you're failing, it means you're moving forward. So celebrate it. Number seven, if you could sit on a park bench and have a conversation with someone alive or dead, who would it be? Don't make me cry. My grandmother. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What would you say to her specifically? Oh, James Jones, you're going to make me cry. Just thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Can't believe I'm crying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she was great. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Number eight, what tool or resource best helps you run your life or your business? Focus mate. Yeah, so can't believe I still got chairs in my eyes. Yeah, focus mate. So it's a a productivity platform where you match with people around the world for either like a 25 minute or a 50 minute session. You say at the beginning what it is you want to get done. You say at the end whether you did or you didn't. But I've met amazing people from around the world. Group support. It's big, isn't it? Totally. Shared mission. Yeah. But actually it gets you to do it because otherwise you'd be sitting there, you'd be scrolling through your phone. But uh, yeah. yeah, best thing. Best awesome. thing. Awesome. Number nine, share one thing on your bucket list. Oh, to visit Australia. Mm, nice. Yeah. And uh, final question, what's one thing you do to win the day? Practice gratitude. Well, there are a bunch of ways to connect with Karen and we'll link to all of these in the show notes. You can follow her on Instagram at I am Karen Dwyer. Take her success with MS quiz that also comes with a free 18-page personalized report at karendwyer.com slash gift and subscribe to her Talk Healing to Me podcast. Again, all of that and more will be linked in the show notes. Karen, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's so great to see you. Oh, James, thank you. Vision board complete. Thanks. (laughs) 
I hope you enjoyed that interview. As you heard, our guests love to hear positive feedback no matter where they're at in their careers. So share a comment on the YouTube version of this episode with your favorite takeaway so our guests know they made a difference in your life today. If you're a business owner and want a copy of the 10 biggest mistakes business owners make with their podcast, go to mistakes.wearepodcast.com or click the link in the show notes. It's a free download and we'll show you everything you need to do to start getting a massive ROI from your podcast so you can help a lot more people, get recognized as the authority in your industry and scale your business faster than ever. And if you haven't already, hit the subscribe or follow button so you can get access to episodes like this one as soon as they are released. The Win The Day podcast is available on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Finally, the right bit of inspiration can completely change the trajectory of someone's life. So if there's a friend or loved one out there who needs to hear this episode or could use some help to win the day, share it with them right now. That's all for this episode. Get out there and win the day. Until next time, onwards and upwards, always.